of the PLT session. Um, the speed on tissue viability and a session that we, we're really looking forward to. So uh, without furthers, we'll hand over to you, Georgina. Thank you very much. Thank you, Craig. Uh, nice to see you all. Um, I've got a bit of a cold. I'm working from home today, so I'm, my voice is a little bit dodgy, but it's on the mend. So hopefully it will hold out for our presentation. Fingers crossed. Um, so I'm here to talk to you today about wound hygiene. I asked him to speak to you um, to introduce you to the concept. Some of you might have heard of wound hygiene before. Some of you might, might be new to you, so that's fine. I'm going to share my presentation with you um, in the moment. Um, I will share the presentation with Craig afterwards as well. I'm just going to switch rooms actually very quickly, Craig, because I've got a puppy. Um, he, she's in a cage, but she's whining. So I'm two, one minute, I'm just going to switch rooms. There, that's better. Apologies for that. Um, can't have a puppy whining in the background, can we? OK, I'm just going to share my presentation with you. OK, hopefully everybody can hear me OK. I just have a thumbs up from one person at least. Can you hear me, Craig? Well, we can hear you. Oh, <laughs> lovely. Absolutely. OK, thank you. Right. OK, so moving on. So wound hygiene is a new concept that we are introducing into Northamptonshire, as I already mentioned. OK, so the, the overview I'm going to talk to you about in the next hour is talking about obviously wounds. It's about biofilms in wounds, so it's about infection in wounds. I'm going to talk about an international consensus document which backs up this um, concept that we are rolling out. I'm going to talk to you about what is wound hygiene. I'm going to tell you about some patient evaluations that we did in NHFT last year. And then I'm going to talk to you about the next steps in primary care. OK. Right, so moving on. So I'm going to start by an introduction talking about the, the wound bed itself, uh, about biofilms. So a lot of you may well have heard about biofilms, but it's talking about infection levels in wounds. Now, biofilms are uh, a, a complex combination of more than one bacteria in the wound. So a biofilm is often known as polymicrobial, so lots of complex uh, bacteria in the wound, which makes the wound hard to heal. And what happens is these bacteria encase themselves in an extracellular matrix, like a jelly material which adheres to the wound bed. And biofilm colonies grow and communicate and become quite strong in the wound. And the trouble is with a biofilm in a wound is that it increases resistance to antimicrobials. It, they protect themselves from the white blood cells, from the host, um, and, they, and they can be really challenging in wound healing. So biofilms are causing a lot of problems for us in wound management. Now, biofilms are not a new concept in themselves. They're there in all forms of nature, anywhere where there's moisture. So you'll find um, documentation of biofilms in water, in ponds, in pipes, in water work. So anywhere where there's moisture, you get a complex biofilm. But there's a lot of work been done in the international consensus document, which I'll share with you, which suggests that biofilms are in a huge percentage of wounds, which wasn't realised previously. So how do we know that biofilms are in wounds? We don't often, and that's the problem. There's often no signs or symptoms of infection in a wound and no host response, apart from the fact the wound may not be progressing. We can't identify them by a wound swab, um, which is you know, our routine way of looking for infection, but we know that they can delay wound healing. So the, the international consensus documents giving us evidence now that they're in the majority of wounds that aren't healing these biofilms. They're a real problem. Sometimes we can look for some signs. For example, you might be, th I'm thinking of a wound, usually a leg ulcer that we might come across, um, which has an, an identified infection. They're on antibiotics or silver and silver dressings. The wound progresses, the antibiotics finished, and then the wound um, goes backwards again and they get in this cycle of antibiotic after antibiotic. So we know that this may be quite indicative of a biofilm in a wound. 
So this international consensus document, and I'll share that with you as well. So I'll send this email to Craig afterwards. It gives us the evidence that they think the majority of wounds that are not healing have got these biofilms in them causing a problem. So what we wanted to decide um, as a trust uh, and what's been looked at internationally is how we can intervene in these potential biofilms. So this document defying hard to heal wounds um, with an early anti biofilm strategy intervention strategy is what has launched us into looking at this program. So hard to heal wounds is a good way to describe wounds and we're trying to move away from thinking of wounds as chronic wounds, a term that we use all the time and I've been using for many years are chronic wounds or so a wound that's hard it's hard to heal by calling them hard to heal instead of chronic because chronic sounds like a condition think of chronic obstructive airways disease it's a disease that can be managed but not necessarily healed uh, you know improved um, resolved whereas a, hard, a lot of hard to heal wounds we can do something about so we're trying to move away from saying chronic wounds are hard to heal um, but that's just terminology at the end of the day so what is wound hygiene? So wound hygiene is a strategy we're implementing to try and re reduce, remove these biofilms to promote better wound healing in these hard to heal wounds. So the wound hygiene itself is a four step process which we're introducing. Um, it's been developed by this um, working group um, sponsored by a company called Convertech. Um, Comfortech make addressing you'll all know Aquacell, Aquacell AG, amongst other things. So Comfortech has, spon has sponsored this international project. Um, and with all these um, specialists, they've come up with this four step process. So these are steps that we look at and we do in some cases anyway, but not quite in such a structured way. So wound hygiene step one is cleanse the wound and the peri wound. So yes, we've been doing wound cleansing already, but previously uh, and nationally, not just us, we've been quite cautious with wound cleansing. The thought was only cleanse a wound if you need to. If that wound is healing nicely without a problem, it's delicate. We shouldn't intervene with it. Well, all that's being turned on its head. What we're saying now is that we should be routinely cleansing wounds and much more thoroughly, much more aggressively, if you like, cleaning the wound and the peri wound skin to reduce all the bacteria, reduce those suspected biofilms. So it's cleansing the wound bed, removing any dead tissue from the wound bed. So step one and two do overlap, so cleansing and debriding um, to reduce that biofilm. And we're recommending when we do this, we use octenolin as an antiseptic. You can still use saline and get a good effect. Saline and gauze you can use and get a good effect in cleansing that wound bed and, and, and cleaning it. Um, but octenolin is the antiseptic solution most of you will know of and something like a Debra Soft cleansing pad, the debridement pad, um, is much more effective. So what we're recommending, and I'll talk through when to do this, which patients in the moment, but the process of wound hygiene is cleansing that wound thoroughly with antiseptic, with um, either gauze or uh, the Debris Soft pad, pad that I've mentioned in circular motions quite thoroughly for at least two minutes, which is quite a long time. When we've been cleansing wounds previously, it's probably been for a few seconds really, isn't it? Or, or you know, 10 seconds at most. But we're suggesting for a full two minutes on these patients to get rid of this biofilm. So in circular mo movements with your Debris Soft pad and antiseptic. And in a lot of cases, the wound might start to bleed a little too, but that is acceptable and it's called pinpoint bleeding and that's showing that you are removing the biofilm. OK, so it's cleansing quite thoroughly, but also to include the surrounding skin, we say up to about 20 centimetres if that's appropriate around the wound as well, because it's thought that the bacteria from the surrounding skin will migrate into the wound itself. So it's about keeping all very clean. OK, so, so that's step one and bordering into step two, so cleansing it thoroughly. And that's the, the, the really structured and much more aggressive way than we've been doing. So step two is debridement. So some of that may be with your Debris Soft pad, because that will remove loose slough too, won't it? Um, but it may be more aggressive than that for people like podiatrists and people that have been trained in sharp debridement, for example, it might be much more active debridement. Okay, so it's removing all that dead tissue as much as you can. OK, then step three is looking at the wound edges. So we get a lot of dry, crusty skin building up on those wound edges. 
And this, this best practice document talks about the wound edges looking like shallow beaches rather than steep cliff edges. So it's getting them down, getting rid of all that dead skin, thick macerated skin. And we can do that again with a debris soft pad or using forceps, for example, removing all that de dead skin. OK, so it's just getting things right back to a nice, healthy wound bed, really. So we're cleansing it, we're debriding it, we're refashioning the wound edges, it's called. So getting those edges nice and healthy. And then the last stage in the wound hygiene step is dressing the wound. And to address the, the residual biofilm, we want to prevent it from growing back again or delay it from growing back again. And one of the products that is ideal for this is Aquacel AG Plus Extra. Which, which you will be aware of, I'm sure you'll have used before. But the, the plus in the plus extra stands for, um, represents a surfactant um, solution part of the dressing. And the surfactant prevents the biofilm regrowing. So in some cases, that might not be the best product. You might think honey might be better. It depends on the wound, another antimicrobial. But Aquacel AG is, is ideal in a lot of cases. So that's the four step process in basic terms. OK, part of wound hygiene. OK, so just to remind you of the, the products that I've mentioned already. So octenolin irrigation, um, there's a photo of it that I'm sure you've used. So it's an irrigation solution for disrupting suspected biofilms, particularly useful against MRA and pseudomonas. Once the bottle's opened, you can use it long or short term. And within eight weeks, you need to use the bottle once it's been opened. And for those of you that, that warm the solution, because solution should be warm to, to body temperature to be used, we know it's safe to keep heating the bottle in between uses. It's absolutely fine. So that's just a little bit about octenolin. And the Debris Soft pad that I've mentioned, and there's a picture of it there. It comes in 10 by 10 centimetre square, or it comes in a Debris Soft lolly shape for the harder to reach areas. They're both available on OnPOS, as is the octenolin now. Now, once we've got um, some education up and running, um, we're also considering putting the Aquacel AG plus extra on, on POS as well, as soon as we've got a bit more education rolled out about this as well. OK, so the Debris Soft pad, as I've mentioned, is for the removal of the dead skin, um, the loose slough and the suspected biofilm. Now, with, with Debris Soft and with wound hygiene in general, the patients that would be very cautious about doing it on is if your wound is very painful, they might not tolerate this much more intensive cleansing, of course. So you might want to look at analgesia, for example, or if a patient's very susceptible to bleeding. So if they're on anticoagulants, you might want to check the clotting or go in much more cautiously. Um, some patients may not tolerate it at all, so with caution. And another group of patients we wouldn't use wound hygiene on is malignant wounds because we could cause a lot of damage, bleeding with, in, in malignant wounds that are not, not appropriate for wound hygiene in this manner, right, so aggressively. OK, so when do we use wound hygiene on a patient? So I've told you what the concept is and why we're doing it. We have got an algorithm. Um, it's, it's usually down in, in one column, but I've put it into two so you can see it on this slide here. So what we need to consider is, does the patient have a hard to heal wound? So if the answer is no, um, they're showing signs of healing as expected, there's no issues at all, then you don't need to implement wound hygiene necessarily. because they don't need the octenolin, they don't need the Debris Soft, everything's you know, going well. If further down the line you find yes, then you can go down the left hand side of this algorithm. So does the patient have a hard to heal wound? Yes. They're not responding to treatment. They're not showing signs of healing. The wound's been there for at least three days or more. You've got signs of increased exudate, slurf, or the wound's getting bigger. And you can consider the four step process. So as I've already gone through earlier, the four step process is the, the cleansing, the debridement, refashioning of the wound edges and dressing the wound with an appropriate antimicrobial. OK, so going over to the right hand side, you do that fully for two weeks at every dressing change. And then at two week intervals, you reassess that and think, is the wound progressing now? If it is, great. Continue with wound hygiene as per plan. But step two and step three, so that's your debridement and refashioning, you can reduce that a little now. Still carry on with your cleansing. And you might want to, it says step four, consider stepping down. You might want to stop your antimicrobial dressing at this point. 
But if the wound's still static, carry on. Carry on again um, with your, your four step process. Carry on with the antimicrobial, OK? And then reassess it again in two weeks time. So it's about going around that cycle. And some week, some patients might need two or three cycles of this. If their wound's static and been that way for a long time, they could have quite a buildup of biofilm. So it's going to take a lot more work to reduce that biofilm. OK, so what we did in NHFT last summer, um, led by my colleague Claire Hone, we did a patient evaluations on this because the concept itself is relatively new. Um, the paper came out, the Inten international consensus document in 2020, but it's only still sort of coming out in several trusts across the country. So Claire has been part of a best practice group, a national group looking at looking at this. And there's a lot of trusts sort of at our early stages, really just starting to implement it. So Claire, just, Claire and the team, we did a, a 10 patient evaluation in our trust. Although we were confident with all the evidence from the international consensus document, we wanted to try it for ourselves locally. So she, she identified 10 patients and followed the algorithm and went through that four step process. So it was early intervention for these hard to heal wounds. And she assessed these patients for a period of four weeks. Often the treatment went on with those patients after she was involved, but she looked at them for four weeks for these 10 patients. So she visited them on the first assessment, then she re-evaluated them after two weeks and then after four weeks. And she found some fantastic results. So of the 10 patients that she looked at, um, you can see there's just some demographics here. So most of seven of the patients were over the age of 72. And they're all over over the age of 52, if you look. So it's an older population, which it quite often is with our wound population. The risk factors below, you see there's a variety of different medical conditions the patients had, um, contributory factors. So it was very mixed. Um, we had more females than males. Oh, sorry, wrong way around. We had more males than females, which I don't think would be relevant to this study, really. Um, the wound duration, you can see the wounds had been there at least three months and some of them had been there for more than 12 months. So they were quite long standing wounds. The wound type was varied, but the 40 percent were leg ulcers. But that's quite indicative of our caseload. Generally, the majority of our wounds are on the lower limb, but there was a mixture that were looked at. Uh, the, the, the wounds at the beginning. Um, there's, there was 12 wounds but on 10 patients because some, obviously some patients have more than one wound. But of the 12, of the 12 wounds, 11 of them were static at the beginning of the assessments. But afterwards, we got 10 of those had improved. So that was good. Um, I think the figure she's come out overall is that was a 70 percent improvement by implementing the wound hygiene process, which is a huge percentage. Looking at the surrounding skin before and after, you can see majority were very macerated, not particularly healthy at the beginning, but afterwards um, six of them had improved and five were the same. So we had significant improvement of the surrounding skin. The exudate levels had started off as a moderate amount of exudate. And then at the end of the study, you could see over half of them were low exudate. So that was an improvement. 60 nearly 60 percent of them had a suspected biofilm that we knew of so some of those others will indeed have had a biofilm but we didn't have the evidence and then afterwards you can see that um we think about 25 percent of them had a biofilm so 75 percent of them we thought not so a, a good improvement again tissue type at the beginning you see two of the ones were necrotic seven were sloughy so that's nine out of the 12 had um you know devitalized tissue in the wound bed and then afterwards you can see we had no necrotic tissue nine of them still had some sloughy tissue but there was an overall improvement and i've got three examples to show you out, out of the 10 patients the ones that were most significant so the first example was a patient who was an 88 year old female patient. She was frail, underweight, had peripheral vascular disease uh, with no further surgical intervention um, advised. So she had arterial insufficiency, so they couldn't do anything else for her surgically. She had osteoarthritis, but, but no other comorbidities were known. She lived in a nursing home, had poor mobility and minimal standing and walking. She was mostly in bed and this also was causing her a lot of pain. The wound was around the malleolus and um, been there for more than 12 months. Uh, superficial wounds, so not that deep as you can see from the photo, uh, it had increased in size and very painful. She'd have repeated infections, antibiotics, which had this cycle of a short-lived response and then deteriorated again. 
it was granulating wound bed but an obvious biofilm over there it was quite um gelatinous material they call it in there there was thick dry crust at the edge as you can see and the measurements were in millimeters 52 by 30 although relatively shallow so it was a problem static heart heal wound so the aims were, the patient aim was that she didn't want to carry on needing these antibiotics so regularly and, she, and the pain was a significant issue to her. If the wound began to heal, then this would be optimal for her. So that was the plan. So it wasn't necessarily be healing because we knew her circulation was poor. So the plan was for Debrisoft, an octenolin irrigation solution, four steps to the edges where she got that dry, crispy skin. It was being redressed twice a week. So it was five minutes intervention twice a week. Um, with Aquacel AG to be used for four weeks. And after four weeks, we had a really significant response. So it reduced in size to 35 by 15 with no crusty edges, no noticeable biofilm, reduced exudate levels and no further infections. So there's the initial and you can see the picture on the right, the significant improvement at week four. Now this lady actually went on to almost heal. Sadly, there was other problems with her health and she did pass away, um, but she was much less pain, thankfully. So her quality of life was vastly improved when considering her circulation was very poor. It did really, really well. That was a positive outcome for her quality of life there. And um, clinical example number two. So the second patient I want to talk to you about. She was um, this is a male patient, 85 year old man. Um, with AF, hypertension, had undiagnosed heart failure at the assessment and venous disease. Produced mobility and walked with two sticks, was still driving a car and he was on anti anticoagulants. Bilateral leg wounds to feet and ankles. The eight month history, so long term again, increased size, exudate, maceration, pain, repeat infections and antibiotics. So you can imagine how much that was ruling his life, um, becoming a real focus, unfortunately obvious venous disease and unable to treat with compression. Um, the wound on the left here was raised, dull granulation tissue to wound bed, you can see the photo there, sluffy film, very wet and macerated, and the dimensions were 65 by 23 millimetres. So the healing aims, the patient's aim was to heal the wounds, to be free from dressings, pain and antibiotics. Um, and also to do his usual daily activities and, and free, the words were to be free, free from fear and embarrassment. So the plan was again, Debris Soft and Octenolin, forceps removing the dry skin from the edges and five minutes each dressing change three times a week with that treatment. So anything from two to five minutes is what we suggest. It depends what the patient can tolerate with the Debris Soft and with the Octenolin irrigation. He also needed some antifungal cream to the maceration as well. So Aquacel AG was used, Keramax Care, wool and a K-Lite, so he wasn't in compression. And this left heel also reduced in size to 50 by 20 millimetres. The surrounding skin maceration and wetness resolved. We had flat wound edges. The wound bed had some thick granulation, sluffy tissue across the base still, um, but signs of healing were noticeable. OK, so if you see the before and after picture, so it's still there, but for his quality of life, just at week four, you can see the maceration had improved, the extra date levels had improved and it was looking healthier. So still work to be done. We're only at four weeks. And when some of these wounds have been here for months on end, they're going to take a long time to heal, even with the best treatment. OK, so the same patient with the right heel, similar appearance with thick granulating sluffy tissue. The edges were raised slightly with dry plaques, dimensions 26 by 18 millimetres. The right heel also was also reduced in size of width, but not in length. But the wound almost healed in the end with signs of epithelialisation, granulation tissue and no maceration. And you can see it, a much improvement there from the right heel. So the third patient I wanted to talk to you about is a 55 year old male with no significant past medical history, apart from he had long term mental health problems, but also poor compliance with wound care for various reasons. Now, this wound was 10 years old, a post surgical abdominal wound. You can see the scar tissue because it's been there so long and really unhealthy looking wounds there next to each other. So we've got wound A and wound B, 20% um, slough. Uh, there's some granulation tissue in there, but not particularly healthy. There was no visible, obvious biofilm, no pain, no infection, and the wounds were static. 
numerous different dressings and antibiotics were tried in the past. And there's the measurements there, 38 by 37 and 47 by 34 millimetres. So the aims for this patient were to heal the wound. So after 10 years, that's quite a challenge. Try new dressings or techniques, was willing to try. Uh, so the plan was to follow the four step wind hygiene approach, apologies. <coughs> Um, supported nursing, supported nursing home staff, um, supporting nursing home staff, because they're not always consistent in use, so we needed to support them. Recommend Aquas LAG and secondary foam dressing. Slow progress for this patient in the first four weeks, but that might have been due to the consistency of, of, uh, of the wound hygiene. But you can see at 12 weeks, we'd got significant improvement. So slow for the first four weeks. I say we've been there 10 years. The longer a wound's there, we might be slower to respond. But you can see how much healthier it looks. Look how clean the wound beds are, how red the wound beds are. And the measurements have improved there. So we've gone from 40 to 38 um, to 25 by 20. So significant improvement there. And wound B, 43 by 32 to 35 by 25. So really really good improvement for a wound that's been there for 10 years. So just to reiterate then the four step process. So we've got step one, so cleansing the wound much more aggressively. Um, and it can be, as I say, with saline or with octenolin in, in if you suspect biofilm and a Debris Soft pad. So the Debris Soft and octenolin are on on, on, on POS. OK, so using that pad to debride as well, using your forceps for the wound edges, getting that wound as clean as you can and including right around the surrounding skin as well. Being mindful of your ANTT process, of course, you might need more than one pad or use a different part of the pad. That's fine. And then dressing the wound with appropriate um, antimicrobial. But like I said, so decide, has, is this patient heart got hard to heal wound? It's not progressing for whatever reason. Are they safe for wound hygiene? Are they taking anticoagulants? Is it a malignant wound? Are they at risk of bleeding? So taking all that into consideration. So what are the next steps for NHFT? Well, within NHFT and then and then primary care, of course, so what are our steps? So in NHFT, we've talked to our IG department, we've talked about our research teams and their and the quality team, and they're all very supportive of us rolling out the wound hygiene. We've sent out comms to all of our staff in NHFT and we're just only just starting the rollout now. We've started very small in the Leg Ulcer Clinic in Northampton. Um, but next, we, it's a very small cohort there. So we, we're planning next to roll out into the community nurse teams in Northampton and going area by area. So what I wanted to do then was obviously talk to yourselves in primary care, but I'm just doing area by area so that the company can support those teams so we can support those teams as we go. So Convertech is supporting us. Um, now in NHFT, the process is integrated onto our system one wound management template. Um, so that four step process is all in there. Um, so the issues, and I'll, and I'll talk to you some questions in the moment, is how can we implement this in primary care when you use more than one system? Because you're not all on system one. Ah, yes, some of you are on EMIS or, or others. Um, so I'd like your um, thoughts in the moment actually on what do you need? Do you need posters? Do you need electronic guidance? Do you have something that you might have on your desktop? Um, so thoughts on how you want the algorithm to come to you and that four step process as well. So the anticipated outcome of this um, um, based on that international consensus document, based on um, what we're doing as a trust, that small cohort of 10 patients, we had at least a 70 percent improvement in, in our patients wounds. Um, in NHFT, we've also done a baseline audit in our community teams on how many wounds, how many patients have got wounds at the moment, how many visits the community nurse is doing. So in six months, 12 months, once we've rolled out wound hygiene, we'll hopefully see a reduction in that, reduction in patient visits required, reduction in types of wound, number of wounds. It's quite a challenge when the number of wounds is thought to be increasing. There's a lot of um, literature to support the fact that chronic, it's not chronic wounds, are hard to heal wounds are increasing or wounds generally, they think um, the English population is increasing by 11% a year on how many wounds we've got. So we're, our wounds are, wound numbers are improving, but our resources aren't necessarily and we need to improve patient outcomes. So we really feel this is quite an exciting project. So how can we 
implement this in primary care and how can we audit it as well are other questions I have really. OK, so I can't see you while I'm sharing, so I'm going to come out of sharing because I've done all the talking so far. I'd be quite interested in your opinions and what you think and have you got any questions? So over to yourselves. Hi, Georgina, I just noticed that uh, we've got a couple of hands up. What I'm going to do uh, just just briefly is I'm just going to ena enable um, everybody's microphones um, just so that they can ask questions because it looks Let, let's be interactive today shall we <laughs> yeah i can see a question in the chat how do we contact tvms for advice regarding complex wounds um if you've got a patient you want to refer to us discuss with us we're very happy to take that um we ask you to fill in a patient referral form so that gives us lots of information and I'll include that in my email to send out to you. I mean, we receive lots of referrals from practice nurses, lots and lots. Um, so I'm happy to share that with you. Uh, so yeah, and I will from, be, I will be emailing the slides as well. Shibor. Sorry, sorry. That's oh, right. There's a bit of feedback now, isn't it? That's what you're struggling with earlier by the chat. Yeah, so um, I've just enabled everybody's microphone. So if you have got Unless you want to ask a question, I see there's a, a hand up from Siobhan. If you want to take yourself off mute, Siobhan, and ask your question, that'd be great. Hello, Siobhan. There's a question from Miriam Cuthbert as well, Craig, whilst you're waiting for the other one to come through. Super. I can see that Sharon has said that we've been told that we, that we are just being kind if we warm the cleansing solution. It's not necessary from a local TVN. <laughs> well, <laughs> I will I will check that with my team. Check who said that. Um, so that's not actually accurate. Um, I'm sorry to say. Um, it's basically if you don't warm your cleansing solution, you can slow down wound healing by a few hours. Um, it's quite complicated on um, and what's happening in the wounds, but it needs to be at body temperature. So it's not the end of the world if you don't warm your solutions. I mean, if it's a once a week dressing, you know, those few hours are not going to make a massive difference. Um, but if it's a very regular dressing, it will. So it is best practice to warm your cleansing solutions. Um, so I will go back and just check who said that and why. So I don't know where that's a miscommunication there somewhere. So apologies for that. But it is it is best practice to warm your solution if you can. OK, do we use a separate bottle of octanolin per patient? Yes, needs to be one per patient. Somebody's put, we've always done that, but didn't like hearing this. I don't know what that means, Sharon, sorry. <laughs> Is that to do with the warming your solutions? Yeah, octanolin is one per patient. How do you warm it? You can put it in, in the sink in a jug of water or that's the best way to do it put it into something else to warm it up to say that, that some people don't have the facilities I get that and time is an issue so it's not the, you know the most important focus but it would be best practice somebody's put it in water it didn't seem to change but it should do a little bit but you know it's, you don't know what temperature you're getting it to but it's best practice so don't 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 focus too much on this today. That's just one tiny part of this whole process. If you can warm it up, it would be best practice. Same with your saline as well. It's easier with saline, isn't it? Because they're much smaller little vials. OK, so we're coming in on the messaging rather than verbally. I have a patient with chronic wounds that's new to surgery. They've been self-managing. He's a very offensive smelling and sluffy. Would you be able to come to the surgery to review with me? Karen, you'll need to refer, send in a referral form. If you haven't got the referral form, I will send it through on the email and send to Craig afterwards. OK, yeah, for individual patients, it sounds like they might need some wound hygiene and screening for infection as well. How many weeks of using Aquacel AG do you do after how many two weeks assessments? It's different for every patient and you might find a patient needs it for much longer. Four weeks, six weeks, eight weeks. If they've had the wounds a long time, we all have always said two weeks and review. And I think sometimes people have heard two weeks and think they're not allowed to use it anymore. That's not the case. If you used it for long term when a patient didn't need it, 
then that isn't good because it might not be so effective when they do need it because the, the wound environment will get used to that and the bacteria will get used to that. But yeah, two weeks and review, just ca carry on. And if you're unsure and get to a point, you can always refer to us for advice, that's fine. Why is one patient only for octenolin? Oh, what each bottle, I, I guess you mean. If it doesn't go home with patient and isn't a prescription item, it's not touching. It's about infection control because it could go near the patient. You're touching it while you're, while you're dressing the patient. It's just a big infection control risk. So it needs to be one per patient. It can, well, if it can go home with the patient, great. Um, but yeah, it, it should be one per patient. So it's just the patients that need it, remember, not every patient. Best to debride, is it best to debride the wound on alternative at appointment or at every appointment? If the patient needs it, it should be at the time. So what I'm the debridement I was talking about earlier is using the debridement pad, isn't it? The Debris Soft. So you're doing that at the same time as cleansing. So you need to do it for a few minutes anyway. Um, if you're trained in sharp debridement, then that's different. Um, but again, it should be done at the time as needed. Um, so not an alternative appointment. What's the difference between Axel AG and Axel Extra? Axel Extra, it's just thicker and more absorbent. There's no antimicrobial in it at all. Axel AG has got silver in it, so it's an antimicrobial. That's the difference between the two. It's the silver. Hang on, my questions have disappeared up the screen again. Where are we? Hang on a second. Okay. Down. I didn't bring my mouse with me in my rush to move. Um, seconds. Um, will the hygiene guidance be on the Arden's template? Well, I don't know how to get it on the Arden's template. Um, there's no reason why not. That's something I'll have to investigate. Um, if that's something that you all have access to, then that might be the way to do it. I can email it as well, so you've all got it, but it'd be better to be on some, you know, a system that you're using, I agree. Um, so if people could let me know if, that, if Arden's is something I will use. Uh, what time would you recommend for debriding, cleansing, compression, etc.? Well, every patient's different, Siobhan. Then we're at, we'd say that all we're adding extra time with this wound hygiene potentially is cleansing it thoroughly um, for a good sort of two to five minutes, depending on the patient. So that's the only extra time we're looking at here. So it's about just cleansing it the wound much more intensively. Um, how long you take for compression per leg? That's what every practice I come across seems to do that differently. Some patients are some surgeries are lucky, you know, and then they. they they book that themselves, half hour, whatever they've got, 30 minutes. Some patients are much more rushed and restricted. So it's whatever time you've got to allow you for that. Look, somebody's put, we struggle with support with TVN at our surgery. Oh, where's that? Rushton Medical Centre. When we do referrals, our replies that we receive back seem minimal support. And Belle, we've got a bit of a grump, a bit of a moan here. I'm sorry about that. Uh, minimal support and basically what we're doing anyway, and we are made to feel like we're idiots. Oh dear, I'm sorry to hear that. We have a patient who has a long-term leg ulcer. TVN have came out and done a tobe Doppler and that was it. We are still no further forward with healing this patient. It's extremely frustrating for the nursing team and the patient. Oh dear. Okay, well, Natalia, if you would email me directly with that, because I obviously need to look at that as an individual case, because that's not good, whatever reason that is. Um, I'll need to find out what my team have done, um, because there might be a rationale on their side. I need to look at the patient records. So if you would email me, please, even if you use our email address that you've got, but put for attention of me, um, and I'll look into that as an individual case, OK? So I'm sorry you feel like that. Right, so Rachel Johnson. So Axel AG is still silver. Yes, it, the AG stands for silver, Rachel. Sorry, but this has been mentioned in our practice before. Some staff mentioned AG wasn't silver. No, it definitely is. It's the AG is the, uh, the um, remember on the periodic table, AG stands for silver. So that's definitely silver. Next question, if wounds are not hard to heal, 
how much dressing should we be cleansing should we be doing um as the as the wound needs it ali so if it if it looks like it needs a bit of saline to cleanse it then fine but if it looks nice and clean it's progressing well then yeah don't interfere with it it's fine it's probably a nice acute wound that's healing nicely that's a good question nobody's asked that yet so yeah i would keep that to a minimal okay uh kareen hi kareen can this approach be found on ardens yes we have ardens i'm going to find out a bit more on that as i say to see if um if that's an appropriate place and if i can get it onto there um so i don't know how to but i'm sure i'll be able to find out and jackie we feel it be useful if it oh another ardens great thank you that's looking like the way then jane yes we would like this added to ardens Emmeline, I've been asked to do a guide sheet for our practice on how to do a referral to TVNs. I asked for your guidance, was told the referral process is being reviewed. The only reason it's being reviewed is, yes, we're looking at going through um, SPOA at the moment because SPOA is where the district nursing referrals all go through. Um, so we're just looking at that. That's the only part of it. Um, the process will be the same for you anyway, apart from just you'd email it to SPOA rather than us. So it's not much to the process. It's just emailing a referral form to us. So at the moment it's to our our, our email address, um, which I'll put on the email and I'll, I'll reiterate it in that for you. So you've got it nice and clear. So it's referring your completed email to us, but eventually it will go through SPOA because they're going to be um, uh, triaging it for us with like a traffic light process to make it easier. OK, so so it's quite simple. OK, Sharon, what would you recommend if Axel AG is sticking as exudate is increasing? OK, it's a good question. So it depends whether they still need an antimicrobial or not, because if the exudate is reducing, the question is perhaps they don't need Axel AG anymore. But if you still feel they do need an antimicrobial, you could use a different product. For example, honey. Honey wouldn't stick as, as much, would it? Because it's quite a moist product. OK, so that might be an option. Um, it's hard to know without the individual wounds. So if you need that individual advice, come back to us with the patient. OK, so just going down again. Um, OK, oh, and Sharon says we've got good support from TVN in Rushton. Thank you. It's nice to hear. Rachel, thank you. I just need it confirmed. Can I email a few about these things? Yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. So if it's about a patient, send a referral form. But if you just want to email about some general bits, you're welcome to email. Be happy to hear from you. OK, uh, Aquacell AG, can it be added to OnPOS? That's what we're considering. It's obviously twice the prices of um, Aquacell. So we've been a bit nervous about it because many years ago we used to have Aquacell AG on OnPOS and the spend went absolutely through the roof. Um, and it had to be pulled. But I'm going back oh, probably 15 years now, a long time ago. Um, but with the education regarding this and the algorithm and the teaching, once we get Convertech going round to you all and giving out lots of education, um, then we've got permission with the with the um, the ICB to consider putting it on with caution and to be monitored as well. So yes, it will be added to OnPOS. I haven't got a date for that yet, but I probably need to speak to Convertech and see when they can get round to a lot of people to ensure we've got lots of education out there. OK, oh, Jackie's from the Brook says she's always felt well supported. That's very kind. Thank you. And Laura, can we use tap water for cleaning um, straightforward wounds? It can in some cases, yes. So it's about assessing the patient, decide whether they're safe, so they're not immunocompromised, they're not high risk of infection. Um, so, for example, wounds like um, um, pylonidal sinus, for example, well known that they that patients shower themselves because of the area that it is. Um, and also leg ulcers in leg ulcer clinics are quite routinely, if they're not immunocompromised or high risk of infection, cleansed with tap water. So you can just choose your patient carefully. OK, so it is possible. Um, but but if it's more straightforward to use your saline, then it's probably safer to do so if that patient's at any risk at all. So, yeah, either or either or but just yeah be careful on your patient selection okay. uh, going down 
um, let's close that. Can use Aquacel AG for infected wounds along with Carboflex to manage the odour. Yep, that's absolutely fine. Um, I would put the Aquacel AG closer to the wound, of course, right on the wound, and make sure your carbon layer is completely on the top to manage the odour. Yep, that's fine. Okay, bring down. I hope I haven't missed any, sorry, because I haven't got my mouse. I'm, it's a little bit all over the place. We've been using Atraumon or Aquacel or cutamid sawback for leg ulcers, which one's best? Well, it depends on the patient. If there's no infection there, um, the extate levels you know, are, are quite what to be expected. They're not, not really high. A trauma will be fine. If you've got a nice clean wound bed there. If you've got a bit of slough as well, a bit more extradate you want to manage, you might want to add in your normal Aquacel. Any infection at all, you could consider your Aquacel AG. Okay, cutamid sawback is good for wet legs. Um, because if it's lower exudate, then it will stick to it. So cutamid sorbax is great. And it's great for um, pseudomonas infection as well. Think green and green. So cutamid is good for that. Sometimes there's more than one option, isn't there, for a patient? It's not necessarily one in particular. And that's why we've got a formulary with more than one dressing on, because it, it will vary what you need. We're just reviewing the formulary document at the moment. I've got a date in March to sort that out, because we do it in collaboration with the hospitals. And we've got... Um, with borrowing the format from Hertfordshire, they've agreed that we can um, copy it and it's got much more guidance in there rather than a list of dressings. And it's going to be really useful for you. So it's got some examples of your wound has got this, then use this. So it's much more, much more direction on there for you as well. Um, but yeah, it will vary. One's not one dressing is not better than another. It depends on the wound. Because remember, the patient's healing the wound, not the, not the dressing. We're just creating the best environment possible. So think what your aims are. Are you managing exudate? Do you want to reduce infection? Are you reducing odour? So it varies. OK, so somebody's poor. Using a single point of access can be a living nightmare. Oh, that doesn't sound very positive, does it? I hope it doesn't make it more difficult to access. It won't do because it's by email. You're not trying to call them up, remember, and they've got people allocated to sort these emails. So they're going to take all the referrals for us from care homes, from yourselves, from district nursing. We'll all go into SPOA. Um, the, our NHFT ones are going straight through system one, so it's quite direct. Yourselves and care homes will go in through email. We're having a list of priorities. So, for example, if I can't think of anything on, on top of my head now, but um, they will then allocate them red, amber, green, following a strict criteria. So we'll know which ones need to be looked at the fastest. But that we still anticipate to answer all emails within a couple of days. OK, um, is there a leg ulcer clinic in Northampton? There still is. Apparently, yeah, at um, Far Cotton Clinic. Um, they've got a very small number of patients there at the moment, I believe, so it's worth referring anybody. But I know there are more practice nurses doing leg ulcers now anyway. I've done leg ulcer courses and are doing them in house, which is probably better for the patient, for travelling, etc. Um, the leg ulcer clinic still, still do see a few, but they do other things in the clinic as well. So there's there's fewer appointments. They do things like catheter changes, I believe, pick lines, that sort of thing. So it's not purely a leg ulcer clinic, but they do have a few appointments there. And Sally says she's found our service helpful. Thank you, Sally. That's nice to hear. Miriam, will ComfyNet be added back on OnPOS as no longer available? I didn't realise it wasn't available, so I don't know if that's a manufacturing error or uh, why they've taken it off. So I'll look into that, Miriam. I'm not sure, but it should be there. There's no reason why it's been taken away. So unless there's a problem at source, so I'll have a look. Nicola White, can we not use System 1 referrals as well rather than SPOA? I've asked this and sadly not because it's external, I believe. Um, and also we need one system for all of you. It'd be very confusing, I think, if it was possible to say you can refer that way, you can refer another. Um, because it's a template that's in our NHFT. I'm not the IT whiz, but there are technical reasons why, sadly. Um, but we are, we will do, we're looking at the referral form again to make it more simple for you, hopefully. How do we refer to Leg Ulcer Clinic? We've had emails rejected. Um, rejected by whom? By Leg Ulcer Clinic, I assume. I'm not sure why. Um, I know if you email me directly, Ruth, I'll check and re reply to you. Um, and I'll check with my team because I, I I don't know. I haven't referred any by myself for a long time, so I have to look into that for you. And thank you for your comment there from our team. 
chain. Will single packs of sterile gauze be added back onto OMPOS? Yes, as soon as they're available. I believe there was problems, I'm afraid, with NHS supply chain and they couldn't get any, but I'll check on that. I need to write these two things down. It's all right. Well, I've got one thing, isn't it? You asked me more than one. There we go. Let me check. Just write that down. Comfy next. And gauze packs. OK. If we have patients with daily dressings, where can we refer at the weekends, please? Now, there are some of you might know this more than me, but I know some patients are referred to places like Highfield. It depends where you are, Rothwell. I don't know what's nearer to you. There are there are places that when patients are mobile, maybe some of the others can help you in your area, but I'll try and find out if they don't know because in Northampton, I think some of them go to Highfield on the Northampton General site. So there are places. Sometimes the district nurses will see them, but I know they're not housebound. It doesn't always happen. So I know that varies, unfortunately. Yep, somebody's put Highfield. So I don't know whether that's for the whole of the county or whether there's anywhere further north as well. I'm not sure. Somebody's put GPEA. I don't know what that is, Karen. Um, there you go. Extended access Highfield for Northampton. Please send dressings. OK, so there is somewhere, but as I'm not sure if there's anywhere further north. Highfield from Tosa. OK, thank you, Jackie. There is an area in the north as well. Good, OK, well, I don't know what that is. There's a clinic every Saturday at Weavers in Kettering. And St Cross Rugby is a walking centre, so there are lots of places because I know the district nurses, they, they, it depends on the patient. So, Miss, but we often refer to EVN for hard to heal wounds. Always received excellent. Oh, thank you. I feel like I've asked for this now, but thank you. That's all very kind. It's really nice to hear positive feedback too. So, I will look back in, into your case um, when you email me, the other lady. Um, Saturday morning, Do that's the one. I knew there was an odd name. Is that Dojok? Um, Jane. Um, Karen Ta um, Toesland is also watching. Oh, there's that's somebody attending. Please don't refer to rugby, it's a minor illness unit. Ah, OK, so not rugby. Arbor Fields, Rushton, extended hub at weekends. That might be helpful for you. There we go. OK. OK, well, that's been lots of questions. That's been really interesting. Thank you. It's good, good to hear questions ad hoc. That was really useful, I hope, for you. Um, and I've got some bits to look into, too. Um, regarding wound hygiene then, so I'm just introducing it to you today. I will email that information to Craig that can circulate, get that sorted for you. And also I will, I will alert the Convertech rep, Sean, I've got a, a, and her contact details are on that presentation as well. So she can come and go through it with you again, your surgery. I'm sure they can bring you lunch if you're allowed that and if you wanted that um, to go through it again. And I will look at Arden's as well to see if that's an option on how I do that. And we'll also integrate it into our wound management education as well, which we run, which you're all welcome to attend. Now, we, um, we do that um, how many times a year? Six times a year. We do wound management face to face. Somebody's put the extended hub at weekends for treatment room services will be coming to an end of March. OK. Oh, no, that's not helpful, is it? OK. Um, th thanks for mentioning that, Georgina. Just to let everybody know that the links to those TVN courses that you mentioned are actually available on our, our training hub uh, course catalogue. We have okay. listed all of those, so whichever venue you want, whether it's Willowbrook or, or Berrywood, the Lovely. And, and the venues are all there. Oh, that's great. Great, Craig. We're also in NHFT, we're relaunching our link nurse group within NHFT to start with because through COVID it went by the wayside. Um, but we've also got loads of fantastic links with uh, practice nursing teams as well. So once that's up and running, we're thinking of um, uh, suggesting a link nurse group for primary care as well. So we'll keep you posted on that and um, we'll talk to you how, how that would best work as well. And let's see if there's any other questions here. Do you know when we're expected to get, do you know when we're expected to get ergo bandages available on OMPOS? If you mean K2, um, I think it's already on OMPOS. It should be, Jackie. Um, I'll double check that for you, but it should be on there. Um, and whilst I'm here, so I'll talk to you about ergo 2 for those of you that have 
know about that. Um, it's, the, it's the new compression bandage. We've still got the four layer bandage system on it, on, on your formulary, and that's um, to carry on until we're comfortable that we've made a switch. We're switching over to K2, which is a two layer bandage system. And for those of you that may have seen, it's the one with the, the dots on it, um, which is a pressure guidance. So it's a really good system because it's two layers instead of four and it's equal to the four layer compression and it's and it's and it's easy application as well. And it's better for patients. because It's less bulky as well. And so we're in the process of switching over. So Ergo did come and speak to you at um, your last PL, PLT, I believe, to introduce it. And they've been going out to lots of surgeries as well to try and meet with you. Um, so the switch is is happening, um, but you'll need to be signed off as competent your team. We've had one practice nurse team already signed off. Um, so it's just a matter of um, getting to you. We're, we're in the process of organising some events. We're doing five around the county through April and May where your team can drop in. So watch out for the adverts. Um, if you've got a whole team that's ready to go and you just can't get out, we can't promise to get to anybody, everybody, but contact us if you're frustrated and ready to go and we'll find away but we need to sign sign you off um okay yes so people are confirming it's already on on post dally says we haven't seen anybody yet how do we get them to come so that's the ergo then so i'll put the ergo details on the email as well and so these drop-in sessions will be really good coming uh, i think one of them we're hoping it's going to be at the kettering park hotel um where else the hilton at junction 15a northampton and there's five in total so we're going to do those so dropping in if you haven't seen the product before they'll go through it all with you you can practice with it and there'll be a tv in there to sign you off if that's what you want um if you're ready for that it's really quite simple to apply you should get it really quickly hopefully um we've got also got um links to show you how to apply it as well okay um okay i think i think the questions are slowing down now craig i think, I think there. i have to say that's that's probably the most questions i've ever seen session, so <laughs> i know i don't think fantastic. i've ever followed so many before but that's lovely all these questions while you're there isn't it it's just having that opportunity um but happy to do really that. well without a mouse <laughs> <laughs> I know, but it kept jumping up too high but maybe that is something we can learn from that maybe that's something that i could do at more of your plts craig even if i come on for half an hour just to random i'll answer anything that's useful um because that seemed to pick up so many different subjects but i'm happy to do that if you invite me in future as well craig Thank you. 